It's a strange coincidence that I watched two movies in a row about isolation. Then again, it's been a strange sort of week. The Fire Pit Podcast would like to present Fire Pit Chats, a podium where we here can talk about whatever happens to be piquing our interest at the time, whether it be movies, pop culture, the zeitgeist in general, and anything else in between. And what better way to start a series meant to escape the constraints of our podcast format than with a discussion about movies where people are trapped? It's not uncommon to see movies released around the same time that are eerily similar to one another. The 90s had asteroids threatening the world and Armageddon and Deep Impact. The early 2000s saw humanity trapped in an illusion of both Dark City and The Matrix. Supervillains learned to become better people in both Despicable Me and Megamind. You get the idea. Sometimes it's purposeful. Two major studios know the other is making a surefire hit and want to beat them to the punch. Sometimes it's spiteful. One studio loses out on a hot IP and decides to just make it anyways and change some of the names around and hope nobody notices. But more often than not, it's honestly just a case of the subconscious, inspired by current events or informed by similar experiences, coming to similar conclusions. Great minds, dot dot dot. Three such movies that I plan on talking about here were all released in early 2023 and are, on paper, about people trapped in houses. And you'd be forgiven for dismissing them as the same kind of film if you just went by that premise alone. Yet it's how they approach that premise, not just in genre or story, but in conveyance of mood and how they keep the audience engaged makes them wholly unique experiences and why I felt they were worth closer examination on this episode. The first movie I want to talk about, Skidamarink, can be summarized thusly. Two kids wake up one morning and ask themselves, Where are our parents? And why are all the doors and windows gone? And then it gets worse. Much, much worse. Skidamarink is not an easy film to watch. It takes an experimental approach with its cinematography, which a lot of people will find off-putting. That said, this is not done to be pretentious, nor are the aesthetics just for the sake of aesthetics. The film isn't just about being trapped, but the horrors of inescapable despair. We are looking through the eyes of toddlers, who are now without any adults to explain what's going on, or to protect them, or even to tell them that it's going to be okay. As such, its world has a granular, washed out, low resolution feel. Not just to denote the decade when the events take place, but to convey the feeling of looking through eyes that are struggling to see the calamity creeping towards them in the encroaching darkness. Because even though their parents are gone, they're not alone. Something lurks in the shadows, manipulating the house. It is malevolent. It is cruel. It is bored. And it refuses to let them go. Gradually, the lights burn out. And in the floating Rorschach of perpetual night, you start to notice that things are wrong. Furniture shifting. The walls stretch. The ceilings creep in. And you are forced to watch this all happen from the height of a five-year-old, small and helpless against this unfathomable terror. And it is your own terror you feel. The children, the main characters who would normally serve as a buffer between you and the monsters on the screen to let you know when to be afraid and when things are safe, they aren't there. Sure, you can see them, but they're obscured, out of focus, distant. As the shadows bear down, you see them less. And finally, by the time the darkness has seized every corner, 
you don't see them at all. Anchored to those bleak, shifting moments of silence, you wonder, are they still there? Or are they already dead? Then in the darkness you hear them. Their quiet whispers. Their meek questions. Crying. Screaming. And in rare, terrifying flashes, you glimpse what they have become and you are trapped with them through it all. Some people have interpreted Skinamarink as being a metaphor for child neglect, and it's easy to see why. Few things are as terrifying as being trapped and isolated, fewer still than being helpless. When you are a child, that is always and all the time. As a child, you have to put your faith in the people you love and who are supposed to love you back to keep you safe. But if that love and safety is not there, and if something else is in its place, then you might as well be trapped in a house with no escape, meant to endure and suffer and never knowing why things are happening, until all you can do is meekly beg. Can we watch something happy now? How do you keep your audience from getting bored? That's easy, I hear you say. Send your characters to exotic locations. Give them some side characters to hang out with. Add some pithy dialogue. Throw in some explosions. Give them a little bit of comic relief here and there. Toss in sex and drugs and rock and roll. All the hits that are sure to keep things exciting. But what if you don't have those things? What if all you have is a person and an empty room? What do you do then? Another film that contends with the concept of isolation, Inside follows a thief who's become trapped while trying to steal some paintings. There is no claustrophobic, faded, low-definition 90s decor like in Skinamarink. Here in this prison that our thief finds himself, everything is high-definition, spacious, modern, no ghosts in the shadows to assail you here. Oh, no, no, no. There is only light and art and a world outside this polished fish tank that is bright and unobstructed and absolutely unreachable. And armed with only his pocket knife and his wits, our thief has to find a way to escape before he inevitably starves to death. At its core, inside is a castaway story. Man is stranded on desert island, man has to use his environment to survive, man tries to escape. Here, the horizon of the vast ocean is replaced by a sprawling concrete skyline. The deserted island is a lavish, high-rise condo in modern-day Manhattan, which, unfortunate for our main character, is less a place to live and more an interactive art gallery. An authentic condo experience, complete with real cans of dog food, a fridge with real dry pasta and moldy crackers, where the door is a bank vault, the windows bulletproof, the faucets non-functioning, the toilets unflushable, the available water completely undrinkable, and where your only companions are a bunch of fish. Pure Manhattan modern pretentiousness. Our main character is going to die here. He is going to starve. He is going to dehydrate. He is going to wither away until there is nothing left but desiccated bones and no one will ever know. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And you are asked to spend two hours watching it happen. It's for this reason why it's easy to understand why most people find castaway movies boring. After all, when all you have is one location and one person, it can feel like there's no movement. And if nothing is moving, that means nothing is happening. And no matter how good your story is, 
if nothing happens, then nobody's going to care. So how do you get them to care? Well, in Skidamarink, the ever-shifting house, the encroaching darkness, the unfocused eye of the camera, those were as much a character as the kids themselves. And drawn in by that uncertain world, you too became trapped by your own terror as the thing in the shadows drags you and them from one inevitable torment to the next. That kept things moving. For inside, they got Willem Dafoe. I'm reminded of the movie Dead Calm, which we reviewed on the Fire Pit podcast some time ago. In that movie, while sailing the open seas, a married couple come upon a man adrift in a lifeboat. He says that the crew of his ship has died of food poisoning and that he's the only survivor. So the husband, played by Sam Neill, thinks something's up and decides to go to the other ship to investigate. While there, he discovers that not only is the ship sinking, but that the crew were all murdered by the survivor who is now alone with his wife on their ship. Trapped on that sinking vessel, he has to somehow repair the damages so he can get back to his wife before it's too late. Sam Neill's character is a Navy captain, and it's assumed he's trained to handle tough situations with focused resolve and nerves of steel. So in this situation, when the world is literally coming down around him and time is of the essence, Sam Neill acted like a man pretending to be completely calm, which came off like he wasn't acting at all. Yes, you the audience could infer that this was an intense scenario, and you could project what he was likely feeling, but going by Sam's expression, you'd have thought he was stuck in line at a Taco Bell. This is why actors hate doing isolation films. Aside from the occasional monologue that lets them flex their skills, actors generally count on having other actors there to help inform the mood or fill the empty silence. But when you have nobody but yourself to play against, when a scene has to be carried by how you react to a situation, it's not just about acting, it's about expressing. Twitches in the corner of your eyes, heaviness in breathing. Even if you're technically not supposed to show it, you still have to sell that you're feeling something. Otherwise, the audience will think you feel nothing. And if you're not feeling anything, then you're not acting. And there are few artists who can act through expression like Willem Dafoe. The man is regarded as being one of the most expressive actors in Hollywood today. The way he can control his voice and body language make him ideally suited to play off whatever situation he's in, even if that situation is just him and an empty room. And at no point in Inside does the audience need Defoe to look at the camera and tell them what he's thinking or feeling. His expressions guide the audience, tracing a straight line between the cause and effect of his thought process. Unlike the kids in Skinamarink, Defoe is constantly moving. He is going to get out, no matter if it takes all week, all month, all year. When he's not working to solve the puzzle of his glass cage, he's occupying his mind. He's keeping himself alive. Because you can see what he's thinking and feeling, you know that nothing he does is contrived or forced because the plot demands it. He is you in this situation. He knows just as much as you would, discovers what you would, which means in his position, you would try to escape the same way, survive the same way, and probably go mad the same way. And go mad he does. See, Skidamarink dragged you into the film and made you experience each new torment. But in Inside, Willem Dafoe burns his feelings into you. His rage, his confusion, his loneliness, the passing days and the changing seasons, the ceaseless drudgery of his work as the uninterrupted view of the Manhattan skyline taunts him from behind just a few inches of glass. It all blazes down upon you just as much as it does him, and you watch as his mind, like a wax figure too near an open flame, melts under the heat of that isolation. As his determination bubbles into panic, as his resolve sinks into apathy, 
and as his hopelessness inevitably pools into bleeding insanity. Defoe gouges all of that suffering into his body, and with each new scar he becomes something different and unique. The house and Skinnamarink change despite the kids, not because of them. But here in Inside, as Defoe is transforming, so too does the condo around him transform, going from a sterile, postmodern waiting room to an expressionist exhibition of anguish. Plain white walls transforming into wild cave paintings. Ikea furniture transformed into ornamented shrines of debris and a towering scaffold inside a lake of blood and water. He is changed by the world around him and his actions in turn have changed the world and by the end we may know just as much about Defoe's character as we did when we started, but you have seen him become something new. Something fractured yet somehow stronger than how it was in the beginning. Something not at all what it used to be. Something that was anything but boring. And that's what I call entertainment. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. movie on our list was brought to my attention when I was just starting this essay, and has more or less informed the entire trajectory of my thesis from then on out. Things Could Always Be Worse is a short YouTube film created by Joel Haver in collaboration with Trent Lankarski. This movie follows two friends who get trapped in a bedroom together and decide to wait it out. That's all there is. No ghosts, no immediate peril, no wild camera tricks or gimmicks to give it a niche appearance. Just 40 minutes of two friends making the most of a lousy situation. As I stated earlier in this episode, films generally require movement to keep things interesting. Normally, this can be accomplished in two ways. First, there's active movement where the main character's decisions directly or indirectly impact the plot and thus move the story forward. Everything that happens in Inside is a result of a decision made by Defoe's character tracing all the way back to his very first choice to break into the condo, and the cause and effect of those decisions are on full display not just in his surrounding environment but in his own physical and mental state of being. In active movement, actions drive the events, which make the moments happen, and so on, and so on. Then you have passive movement, where the story happens not because of the characters, but in spite of them. For the kids in Skidamarink, nothing they do causes or alters what happens to them. They don't even have a choice to be there. They just wake up one morning and find themselves in a horror story, and from there are dropped by the thing in the shadows from one torment to the next. In passive movement, we count on the characters to be affected by the events and their surroundings, but nothing they say or do causes or changes anything that happens. Much like a roller coaster, it's all on rails, and the kids, like us, are just along for the ride. Things Could Always Be Worse offers a rare third option, idle movement. In idle movement, characters are placed in a situation that they have no control over, like in passive movement, but the situation doesn't have any control over them either. If isolation for Skinnamarink was a non-negotiable terror, 
and an inside something to be escaped at all costs, here it's just a thing to be put up with for the time being. Neither permanent nor inescapable, just something that, eh, it'll end. So for things could always be worse, the question isn't if or how you will get out, but what do you want to do until then? You see this more often than not in the slice of life genre of fiction, where the story mostly centers around the mundane aspects of life. They go to work, they go to class, they can't remember where they parked their car. To put it in postmodern terms, Idol Movement is a show where nothing happens. The events don't move the characters forward any more than the characters move the events. The situation's just there as a hard wall for the characters to bounce their personalities off of. It's the characters and what they reveal about themselves, that's what drives the movement. And here's the draw of things could always be worse. Not the conditions that trap the characters or what they do to get out, but Joel and Trent themselves. Joel Haver has a mumblecore approach to his work and relies heavily on improvised dialogue, which, in a grounded situation such as this, makes his and Trent's interactions feel heartwarmingly genuine. There's no wild cinematography to keep things flashy, no unnecessary drama to make the audience think that this is a situation that's going to end their friendship, or that they're never going to escape. While the conditions that keep them trapped are slightly contrived, the two have such a natural chemistry that, at times, it feels like you're genuinely getting to watch these two waste time until they eventually get out. And at those times when they're opening up to one another, the line between what they're saying in character and what they themselves actually mean does blur a little bit. So whether it's because of the improvised nature of their dialogue or the real life connections between Joel and Trent themselves, even though there was no active or passive movement, even though nothing technically happened, by the end, you just watched these already close friends brought even closer by this shared circumstance. Movies about being isolated aren't exactly a modern invention. Heck, they've been making movies about people being trapped since they started making movies. I'm sure some of you out there thought of at least one or two films that deserved to be on this list while you were listening to this episode. And that's why I wanted to discuss these three movies in particular today. Their shared circumstances. Not just the situations of being trapped and isolated, but what made them and ties them together. That's what I can't help but reflect on here. See, 2020 is etched into our collective subconscious now. We're a generation that woke up one morning to find our doors locked from the outside, forced there by situations that we had no control over, never knowing when we would be allowed out, if ever. Who among us doesn't have a story from that year that wouldn't end? Stories of terror. Stories of survival. Stories of escape. Stories of just biding your time until it, you know, came to an end. <laughs> Heck, there's probably a love story somewhere out there. That these three films were made around the same time doesn't surprise me, and I don't expect them to be the last. After all, the doors are open now, but now we all know that at any moment, without warning, someone or something can shut them again. And that's not something we're going to forget any time soon. But we also know that as long as there's a tomorrow, and as long as we have something, someone, to hold on to, then there will be a sun waiting on that horizon when it's through. After all, as the wise man once said, things could always be worse.
Thank you for listening to the first episode of the Fire Pit Chats. This is still a work in progress, so the format and the name itself is still very much subject to change. Right now, these are meant to be YouTube exclusives, but there's nothing saying we won't post these on our main podcast site in the future. If you have any thoughts on how you would like these segments to go, or if you have any ideas of what we can talk about in future episodes, then let us know in the comments. For now, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel here, and while you're at it, go check out our main site at www.firepitpodcast.com for all of our past and latest movie reviews. For now, I've been Tom, and this has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there.